Hi, welcome to Tradition Today. I'm Father David Smith. I'm the pastor of St. Sophia's Greek Orthodox Church in Syracuse, New York. And uh, we're very blessed today to have Father Vladimir Cantor with us. Welcome, Father Vladimir. Thank you. Uh, Father Vladimir is a, a recently ordained priest, and uh, he was ordained uh, in Mexico uh, in order to serve the Orthodox mission or the Orthodox Church in Mexico. Tell me what your assignment will be. Yes. Well, my bishop is Archbishop Alejo in Mexico City and has ordained in the beginning of June of this year. And um, I was asked to go and help with the missions in Mexico. Um, as most people would realize, Mexico is mainly a Roman Catholic country and the uh, Orthodox Church in America started uh, the mission in Mexico City around the year 1970. Um, Archbishop Dimitri, uh, who's reposed not too long ago within the past couple of years, um, went to Mexico, did a lot of work with, with um, the church when it was first getting established there. And, um, so now there are other mission parishes. Uh, some are amongst indigenous peoples. Some amongst um, so some people are, are Russians that uh, immigrated to Mexico and uh, want the Orthodox Church there. And in those parishes, there's Mexicans, um, you know, Russians. Uh, some other examples are um, Roman Catholic communities that uh, have become Orthodox entire communities little by little, uh, taking on the Orthodox faith, being chrismated, um, received into the faith. And so th there's a many different uh, situations in Mexico. Um, well, let, let me ask you, how many, how many churches under the OCA are there in Mexico? That, would you be able to estimate? Well, there's the main cathedral, mm -hmm. and there's a mission in Guadalajara, uh, Colima. Guadalajara, Guadalajara and Colima are two of the places that I specifically right now will be helping with. But there, there are other places that I wouldn't be able to tell you the names of all the communities because many of them are in indigenous towns. Mm -hmm. And churches still aren't physical churches still aren't necessarily built. They will meet in homes, so it's very apostolic in a way. In, in, it, it's, um, you know, and there, there's several different, different communities, and there's actually um, indigenous people um, contacting the bishop interested in the Orthodox faith. They, they weren't interested in Catholicism when it came around a few hundred years ago, and now they're interested in you know, icons are appearing in their homes. They, they found icons somehow. The icons have found them. They've made their way into mountainous areas and rural areas of Mexico. And um, it's, you know, very, very touching that, um, you know, God, God actually has reached out to these people. The Orthodox Church has reached out to these people through these holy images. And now they're uh, finding out, well, who... Who, who produced these holy images? Who, yeah. who's, who's uh, writing them? Who's, who's painting these icons? Where did they come from? In this church, and then, you know, so they, they, they find, uh, you finding know, the, the, the bishops, faith, right. finding the faith through the icon. Huh? So you're, you're, you're saying that really there are no Mexican priests. There are no, uh, or very few. Very few. There are, as far as I know, there's four in the whole diocese of Mexico in the OCA. And there's a bishop that I joined um, to help go down intermittently a few times a year. 
uh, for periods of time to, to help. I don't know exactly where I'll be sent. I, I, I do know that for right now, like I said, uh, be Colima and Guadalajara, but mm -hmm. perhaps there'll be some other, other places that I'll, I'll be sent. There's, there's we'll parish down in, in Chiapas on the border of near Guatemala. There's some in Vera, Vera Cruz, referred to as La, La Huasteca. Mm -hmm. There's places in Monterrey. So there, there's various places around Mexico where there's, there are mission churches, but um, they're, they're basically missions, um, not full parishes as people you know, would, would expect. Like in the United States, there's a lot of Orthodox parishes, whether, whatever jurisdiction they might be right. under. But. So these are, uh, the, it must be very difficult on, those, uh, on the Mexican priests who are there to have to, uh, um, you know, tr travel from place to place. Are they doing liturgies, and so they're obviously not having regular liturgies, and uh, at all the different places. That's very correct. Mm. In a lot of ways, it's it's the way the mission work in Alaska mm -hmm. it was done uh, back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, there there just weren't many priests and. Uh, and even recently, um, a higher monk that I knew in Alaska when I was a child would, would travel between par parishes on the islands and uh, through the interior on dog sled. And he said, he, he remember him telling me that uh, it was not unusual for him not to visit a parish, uh, but twice a year, wow. maybe three times a year, hmm. where they would, they would go to the different missions and, and uh, have a service. And because there's so few priests Mm. Um, and the rest of the time, the people do reader services um, or, you know, pray as the church t together, right. uh, but they don't have a priest. Or maybe they have a deacon or maybe they have a reader. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the situation, you know, in, 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 in Mexico. So um, we're really looking at the, uh, we're, we're looking at the foundation, really, of a of another uh, mission field uh, in Mexico. Right. Now, do you, uh, w what's it like uh, to serve there? You're coming from uh, New York and you're, you're coming in mm -hmm. and uh, celebrating with them. I, you speak Spanish? Yeah, somewhat. I, I can get by in Spanish. I'm, uh -huh. I, I, um, I'm looking forward to improving my Spanish by being there quite a bit more, but I can serve in Spanish and... Uh -huh. um, oh, wonderful. So, what, I mean, what's it like to serve with them? They're, they're hungry to have priests come or they... Uh, I mean, what's, it, what's it like? Well, it's interesting. I, when, I, when I was ordained, I was asked that I could come maybe two or three times a year for you know, periods of time, maybe 10 days, you know, at a time. Mm -hmm. And I, I get down there and the, the people, the people are uh, immediately like, some of them like, so you're going to come like, like every other week at least, or it's like, <laughs> like it, oh, so wow, they, they, wow. <laughs> they, they really, they, they really would like to have somebody all the time. Yeah. Um, um, oh, no. Oh my goodness! It's, it it must be uh, it must be exciting, but also heartrending to uh, yes to see. I remember reading about uh, um, Saint Raphael of Brooklyn, uh, you know, traveling from place to place, uh, even sometimes going to uh, little cities out in the West. This was in the United States out in the West and just looking in the phone book for Arab names, mm -hmm. uh, Arab Christian names and calling the people up and, and they would want, they would want to be married and have children to be baptized and, yes. and all sorts of things. And he would do all of these things and then go on to the next. It's uh, very exciting, but also very exhausting. Yes. So. Now, yeah. um, so you've been recently ordained, um, D just tell me about uh, what it was. What's it like to be ordained? I mean, I know, I know, but maybe our audience doesn't know. <laughs> wow. Well, 
it, it's a big responsibility given to, um, to, you know, to anyone who's ordained to um, be sure that to be a, a good example um, and to you know preach the, preach the word of word of God um, accurately in our orthodox orthodox way um, and you know to, to try to lead a life through example like mm -hmm. like our 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 Lord answered uh, someone in the crowd when his his mother was sitting at his feet and he he answered and said but blessed are those who keep hear the word of God and keep it yeah. you know so it's not just enough to be associated and wear the, wear, wear the, you know, and then the collar and the shirt or the cassock and the riyasa and cross. It's not enough just to be part of that quote unquote family, but it, it's more important to uh, try to lead the life of, to hear the word of God and keep it. Mm -hmm. And so that's an awesome responsibility. Um, but um, I would say being ordained, I don't feel that I all of a sudden became, wow, I'm another person. Yeah. Or wow, I have all this grace that I'm all special now. Mm -hmm. And I felt very much the same. Only that now I have a, a hopefully that God would, would um, bless me and, and um, you know, everything that's lacking and imperfect in me, that the ordination would, would, um, would hopefully um, help me with everything that's lacking, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that the, the prayers of the ordination are that way also. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. I, you're I right. think that you know the priest has to continue to to grow. Just just to, just as um, the the faithful, all the faithful, that make their their continual journey to the to the kingdom um, of God. Uh, throughout their whole life, they, you're, it's not like you're ordained and all of a sudden you're not. It's not like you're ordained and all of a sudden you're saved or different. Mm -hmm. It's it's a process. Well, I know that you you continue to maintain your vocation as a as a physician. Yes. you you work in an emergency room. Yes, emergency medicine. Em emergency medicine here in Syracuse, and yet at some point, how long have you done that for? Emergency medicine for 14 years as an attending, okay. but three years as a as a resident. So like 17 years I've been in the field. Right. So for 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 17 years. So at some point along that way, you said to yourself, "I'm going to go to seminary." Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. well, I well, said to my so I said to myself when I was a little boy, I was going to go to seminary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt that way. Um, huh. I just put it off for a number of years for. Various reasons, and you know, I um, God ended up um, strongly calling me while I was a physician to um, to uh, do what I felt I was supposed to do as a as a as a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Now, do you so. are you following God's calling uh, when you serve as a physician? I would hope so. Um, you know, I see it's a very interesting question because, you know, in medicine, we help people, we minister to them. Um, and when I was a resident, I was wondering to myself, well, do I want to do a fellowship? Because there are subspecialties within emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. Like I could have done a, a fellowship in toxicology. Um, you know, there's the... EMS systems, uh, there, there's other fields that I could have done, some are ultrasound fellowships. Um, but nothing, nothing spoke to me to like do some fellowship or further study for a year or two after. And all the time while I was in medical school, and even as a resident, I said, well, someday I'd like to do mission work. Someday I'd like to do mission work. And in the back of my head, it was always like, well, maybe you could do mission work. You, you should, maybe you should be a priest too, like you wanted to years ago. And be uh -huh. both if you're going to do mission work. Uh -huh. 
So I, I put that, you know, for years and years, just, you know, kind of keep your head down in the trench, keep working, mm -hmm. keep seeing patients, keep working, 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 working. And, and then, you know, after a while, you know, patients started saying certain things to me, and I had certain experiences, and, mm -hmm. and I realized that, um, you know, I, I really, I, I should at least go to seminary and, and see what happens and see, see if... Um, you know, I'll, I'll be a priest mm -hmm. um, as well. And I it took my time. I didn't rush. I waited. How, how wait. long did you go through? How long did it take you to go through seminary? Three, three years. I finished oh. my Master of Divinity, but then I took another two years and took my time. Um, and I didn't rush right into... I didn't ask anybody to ordain me. I was asked. asked so. Mm -hmm. so I see being ordained... A priest is kind of like that was my the the completing you know medicine is a very good thing there's, there's a lot of um, I would say like parallels between medicine and uh, the priestly ministry mm -hmm. it's just that in medicine many times um, well, in America, we hear it all the time as a physician. I want this pill. I want this. I want this. I want this. You know, the patients come in and tell you now what they want. Mm -hmm. And um, in a lot, of, a lot of ways, that's, that's good that you have an, an educated public. But the one thing that physicians may not do enough is how are you going to change? for the better, hmm. rather than just taking the pill so that you can continue doing your bad things, the bad habits, mm -hmm. how are you going to change the repentance? And, you know, and so the, the life of a Christian, um, you know, the, the life in Christ, the one of repentance, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, true, it's the true way mm -hmm. in the Orthodox faith, the true faith. So, um, you know, just to take pills and try to put band-aids on problems through people's lives. You know, as a physician, you, know, you can, many times, we end up putting band-aids on or not getting to the real root of the problem and, and um, the root of the human condition, the, the, fallen, the fallen world, the yeah. fallen natural state. You know, you, often in, in medicine or, you know, you know, Philosophically, you hear people talk about the, um, oh, that's just human nature. And our response as Orthodox Christians is, no, 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 that's fallen human nature. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that, that's not the way God intended people to behave. Yes. Um, and huh. Well, I, I, I recently had, when I, was, when I was at a church one day, I had a, a physician say to me, you know, that, uh, that um, people were coming in and uh, coming into the office and uh, and this person was was saying well here's what you need to do to get better and they would nod their heads and they would take the information and they would leave and they would come back six months later or a year later and they hadn't done any of it you know and it was it was kind of like um, this physician was saying to me, you know, it gets very, very frustrating. And I said, well, now you have a little bit of an idea of what my job is like, you know, when I'm when I'm saying to people. So in in many ways, you're right. There is there is an overlap there in terms of you know saying to people, you know, we have that uh, the sacraments that bring you into into contact with God in the immediate, uh, but uh, then, you know, the next day you're still living your life and you're still needing to work out your salvation with repentance. Right. Yeah, I like, I like what you're saying there. Was there anything about seminary that, that surprised you? Was there anything that you encountered during those years that sort of made you step back and say, gee, I, I, I'm learning something entirely new? Mm. Well, there are various things that 
people learn at seminary. Um, I don't think it's possible to develop the orthodox ethos in the have an idea of the the orthodox tr tradition just by being at seminary for two or three years and getting a, a degree, mm -hmm. you know, and passing classes. So okay, I I think what what I did gain from uh, s seminary was a lot of the the um, uh, studying like the the dogmas the 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 councils and all of the, all of the the specific informational you know, things and that that I I didn't know as much I I knew the church more from experience growing up right. being part of the faith the services the singing and the one thing I did realize uh, being at seminary was that if one goes to the services and one uh, listens to the Vespers, uh, the verses at Vespers, the Stichira, the Matins. Um, if one reads the canon at Matins, um, there's a lot of theology in that. Yeah. And a lot of the theology that one learns and reads about in books and takes in Tessin Seminary is right in the services, the Divine Liturgy. Yeah. So if... And then, of course, there's other services besides the Vespers, Matins, the Divine Liturgy. There's you know, um, you know, the, the different various offices yeah. of the day, um, mm -hmm. different hours of the day, and there's a lot of theology that is in each of those services. Mm -hmm. So, if one keeps this, this, um, this full tradition, and, right. and in some, and in some ways, if, if this more, f um, the tradition's there, but if people j just come to church and they practice this and they try to to um, do some of these things at, at home even just quietly you know that this this life of prayer uh, this the, this is theology mm -hmm. you know the the communion with God the, and um, so I, I guess I guess what I what I realized uh, more than anything at seminary was that all of these, the, the writings of the early church fathers and the, the um, decisions of the councils, um, there, a, a lot of this is already just in the services that people can be part of. Yes. Uh, I, 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 boy, I couldn't agree with you anymore. I, um, I've been a priest for 22 years, and um, there are so many times when, uh, especially we come to those services that are um, that we do once a year, maybe uh, you know right. uh, the the service of the Holy Cross uh, we just did recently at church, and it it amazes me that year after year after year there's something in it that just jumps out at me and, and really just, right. you know, wow, I, I could study so many different things and read so many books and I would never get that insight that I got just hearing it, you know, in the, in the divine liturgy or, right. as you say, the Vespers of the Orthros services and so on. Right. Well, Father Vladimir, it's been very good to have you with us. Uh, you know, God's blessings upon your priesthood and on your mission to Mexico. Sounds wonderful. Uh, we, ask, we ask everyone's prayers for uh, the church in Mexico as well as in uh, Guatemala, another area that our church is involved with, and um, that, that the, uh, the faith would spread that God's grace would touch uh, the people uh, with his life, uh, with, his, with his grace, with his love for, for all mankind. Great yes. to have you with us. Thank and you for having me. Great to have you with us as well. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, and join us again on Tradition Today.
this is a museum which traces the, the path of orthodoxy, the journey of orthodoxy to America. Um, it was established to, to show the, the roots of the Orthodox Church in America. Now this museum was set up by Father John Parrish and um, the initial entry point has a exhibit of various um, artifacts, costumes, uh, cultural traditions of different peoples who have came to America and it represents Ellis Island which was the the entry point for many of the people who did come to America especially at the end of the 19th century the beginning of the 20th century when most of the Orthodox people came to America. The section on Alaska uh, shows some of the the artifacts cultural artifacts and traditions of the Alaskan native people the Eskimos, the Aleuts, the Indians St. Tichon's Monastery is the oldest Orthodox monaster in America. It was founded in 1905, and it's in the, the village of South Canaan in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. The founder of our monastery, St. Tichon uh, of Moscow, Patriarch of Moscow, uh, and founded this monastery in 1905. His, uh, his Montia, when he was uh, Metropolitan of Moscow, is here in the monastery. Um, similarly, we have vestments from um, St. Nikolai of Zicha, the Serbian bishop who um, was rector of the seminary. The uh, section on showing the celebration of the Lenten Holy Supper uh, prior to the celebration of the, the vigil service for the nativity of, of our Lord Jesus Christ um, shows what a typical um, home in Karpatha, Russia or in the Ukraine uh, might look like prior to that um, Holy Supper meal. The family would share together before going to church. If people are interested, and they're certainly welcome, we, we have this exhibit here be, because um, we want to share th these things. The Icon uh, Repository was built in 1995. It was a gift to the seminary by Mr. John Guzzi. It was um, built behind the old monastery bell tower. It's a collection of icons, 400 icons in it, the collection, uh, many from Russia, uh, many from the 19th century, but there are also some from the 17th century, from the 18th century, and there are also from other countries, from Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia. Um, there are two icons from uh, uh, Syria, from Dalmatia. Is a Coptic icon, so it's it's quite a varied collection. And uh, the oldest icon is from the 15th century. There are also 17th century, 18th century icons. One of the uh, items in the exhibit is a gospel book that was given by the first Romanov Tsar Michael to a monastery for women in Russia, and that was um, dates back to 1636. That many non-Orthodox people have come to see the collection because they're interested in icons or or um, liturgical works from uh, that those periods of time to those countries, and so they've come to visit the collection, and we're able to introduce them to the Orthodox faith. It's an impressive collection. We've had priests come from Russia, and they've been impressed. They said, then, other than in large state museums, there are very few places even in Russia we have uh, this concentration of, of icons. Uh, we've had um, classes from local universities and colleges, and um, even from high schools, the Russian studies classes or art classes. Um, so it's a resource that people have come um, and it's really an evangelical tool in that sense that many non-Orthodox people have come to see the collection because they're interested in icons or, or um, liturgical works from uh, that, those periods of time to those countries. And so they've come to visit the collection and we're able to introduce them to the Orthodox faith. So it's best to make an appointment uh, when would one would want to come and so we can arrange a time of mutual convenience so someone could show you uh, the museum and, and explain things to you. Mm -hmm.